Good morning, everyone. So my name is Sergio, and thank you for joining us this morning on Saturday, taking the time to join us. Um, so Abriana, Natalie, and I, and one other member, Prachi, who couldn't be here, are part of STEM Starters at Columbia. And we sort of just initialized, this is our second seminar series. Um, we're Natalie, she's a graduate student in a lab that focuses on trying to understand sort of our sense of smell, will guide us through what is the biology of sense. Um, and hopefully we can all learn a little bit more about it. Um, so definitely there will be a time at the end of the talk to ask questions to Natalie or any of us about anything that you want you know, that you want to ask, feel free. Um, but if you have questions throughout, do put them in the chat. So, you know, I'll read them and I can interrupt Natalie if you want and, and read off your question to her. So do put your question in the chat and yeah, Natalie, whenever, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Yeah. So as Sergio just introduced, I'm Natalie, everyone. I'm a third year in graduate school here. Um, and so what I focus on is studying the biology of sense. And as Sergio said, feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, there's a few times that I'll ask a question to you guys. Feel, when I say that, feel free to unmute yourself and shout out an answer or put it in the chat. Um, I'll try and get someone to, to reply to me if I can. So, okay. So before I get into anything, I wanna talk a little bit about hedgehogs. So hedgehogs have very poor eyesight, unfortunately. Um, they can see colors, not as well as we can, um, and they really just see shapes for the most part. So they can see other hedgehogs, but when it comes to finding food on the ground, that's really hard for them. Um, and lucky for them though, they have an extremely good sense of smell. And they can actually smell food that's buried below the dirt up to one inch and sometimes they can smell further than that. And so they really rely on their sense of smell to find food and to make up for their lack of being able to see very well. Um, and hedgehogs are not the only animals that rely on their sense of smell. So moths actually use their smell to detect other moths to mate with. And they can actually detect single uh, chemicals that are put off by other moths from up to a mile away in the air. And when they pick up on that single chemical from the air, they adjust their flight course from there. Uh, now the albatross bird I found interesting. It actually can smell sea, uh, schools of fish under the sea as it's flying in the air. So it will actually adjust where it flies based off of where it picks up scents of schools of fish underwater. Uh, now we have one of my favorite examples, moles. They actually cannot see at all and they have very poor hearing. So they really have no major sense to help them find food and avoid becoming food except for their sense of smell. And similar to hedgehogs, they can find food in seconds without seeing a single thing around them. Oops. And then finally, there's us. So we don't necessarily use smell to survive, but we need to be able to smell to taste food well. We also use our sense of smell to smell dangerous chemicals, for example, a lot of cleaning chemicals that are not good for us, we pick up very pungent odors from them. We use our sense of smell to smell smoke and know how to get out of a room. And our sense of smell is also funded a billion dollar perfume industry, simply based off of how we want things to smell. And so I hope I'm convincing you now that a sense of smell is very important. So smell or olfaction as it's called in our field, um, is really a complex issue that's been studied for decades. And a lot of people, including our lab, have put in a lot of time to try and understand the underlying biology of it. But before we go into the biology, I think it's important to go into the anatomy of our nose and what's going on when we smell something. So can you guys see my cursor, by the way? Yes? So when we smell an odor in the environment, as you all know, we pick it up through our nose and it goes into our nasal cavity at that point. So once in the nasal cavity, that odor is detected by a layer of cells called the olfactory epithelium, which I'm gonna go into on the next slide. But once that olfactory epithelium picks up a signal and finds that we've picked up a scent, it sends this signal to the olfactory bulb, which is a structure in our brain. Now the olfactory bulb helps process this signal and then it sends it to our limbic system to be further processed. So once this smell is detected and sent to our brain, our brain does all the energy of figuring out what it is, what it means, and maybe associating memories to it and telling us what to do from there. And now, as I mentioned though, the olfactory epithelium is really what we're gonna be focusing on today. 
So this epithelium is a layer of many, many neurons crowded together, which is what you're seeing here. Now these neurons bind physically to chemical odorants from the outside environment. And when they bind to that odorant, because they're a neuron, they can transmit a signal all the way along until they send it to the olfactory bulb, where, as I said, it gets processed. And, oops, sorry. Uh, and so, as I said, they bind to chemical odorants from the external environment. But the neurons themselves are cells. They actually cannot bind to a chemical odorant on their own. They need the help of a protein called an olfactory receptor. And before I go into olfactory receptors, though, I want to just review what a protein is. So proteins are biomolecules that are relatively large that exist in our body, um, and they help us survive, essentially. They have a wide range of functions. But can people maybe yell out some examples of proteins that they can think of? Anyone, just feel free to unmute yourself. Insulin. Anyone else? That's one. Anyone else want to call one out? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so there's, I mean, every protein that you guys just listed has a completely different function. Um, so yeah, there are protein enzymes, which bind to other molecules and help catalyze reactions. We have uh, structural proteins, uh, such as keratin, that help make up our hair, they make up our nails, and a huge amount of our cells. There are antibodies, which might sound familiar to you guys as they've been talked a lot about with COVID-19. Antibodies are sort of our first line of defense against viruses that infect our body. And then finally, I'm gonna be focusing today on membrane proteins. So membrane proteins exist in the membrane of cells. And in our case, olfactory receptors look a lot like this. So they reside in the membrane of olfactory sensory neurons, and they're actually exposed to the external environment. And that's what allows them to bind to chemicals. And so this is a really simplified diagram of an olfactory receptor. So as I said, these olfactory receptors reside in neurons in our olfactory epithelium, and they function to physically grab onto odors from the external environment. And once they bind to that odorant, they elicit a signaling cascade in the neuron that allows it to eventually signal to the brain that it has picked up a scent. Now, what's really interesting about olfactory receptors is we actually have many, many, many of them. And every olfactory receptor binds to one unique scent from the environment. So for example, if you smell a skunk in the environment, you have a specific group of receptors that each bind to all of the chemicals that make up the smell of a skunk. And so all of these unique receptors code together for the skunk smell, they send that to your brain and it can process that. And so now that we know there's many olfactory receptors and they all recognize one scent, the other important thing to know about this system is all of the olfactory sensory neurons in this epithelium only make one type of olfactory receptor. So every neuron, such as this red one here, it has many, many receptors, but it only makes one type. So for example, this neuron in the epithelium is only going to make the red olfactory receptor, no others. This one is only going to make the yellow one and no others. And so this is really interesting because when we're looking at a picture of the olfactory epithelium here, where every color is depicting or representing an olfactory receptor protein, you see there's a huge amount of diversity. So there's many, many different receptors that are being made, but every neuron only stands to make that single receptor. And somehow all of these combine together to help us smell better. Oh, Natalie, could I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so is it possible that maybe like for example, we would have a whole bunch more of the red receptors and the green receptors to like be tuned to certain smells more than other smells. Yeah, definitely. So there are some specific chemicals that are more common to be smelled that we have more of. Um, and there are some that are less common that we have less of. But for the most part, it's actually a pretty random distribution, which is really interesting, given that we smell some things so much more frequently than others. Overall, it's pretty well balanced out, which is interesting. Uh, somebody quickly asked, do people yeah. with different gender have different olfactory receptors? Oh, so. that is a really good question. Yeah, so we have a region in our nose that detects pheromones, but we actually all have the same olfactory receptor proteins. But 
um, people who identify as male or female, they might have different interpretations of how they smell things, but everyone has the same receptors themselves. Does that make sense? Um, and so now I want to kind of give you guys a better picture into what is happening in the olfactory epithelium when we smell something. And this is a really cool video that diagrams that. So what we're looking at here is a real image or a real video of the olfactory epithelium of a mouse. And so what these scientists did is they floated over some odorants, some chemical odorants that could bind to these olfactory receptors. And they had a way of imaging when these neurons got activated. And so you're gonna see the odor gets flushed over and you see all the neurons light up super brightly. So here they are, and you see a huge amount of odor just flushed over and all those neurons activated. You see some are going on their own. Some of them are bright here and there. And then as this huge amount of odor is passed over, they all light up. So this is constantly happening in our nose. We have a cascade of many different neurons binding to things sending the signal to our brain. And I'm gonna show that one more time. So you see huge amount light up, and then you still see there are some picking up other odors, but when this mixture is passed over, a huge amount of signal lights up. So I think this is a really good way to show what is actually happening in your nose at a given time. These neurons never stop. As you sleep, as you walk around, they're always binding to sense and firing off to your brain. Your brain is the thing that does the work and says, okay, I'm smelling this, I'm smelling that. Okay, and okay. So now we kind of have an idea that we have these neurons in our nose that make olfactory receptor proteins. These olfactory receptor proteins bind to sense and then allow the neuron to signal to our brain that we're smelling something. But how many olfactory receptor proteins do you guys think humans have? Just yell out a number or put it in the chat. Do you think we have 10, 10,000, 100,000? 10,000. 10,000, anyone else? No one else. Okay, 10,000 is the running guess, I guess. So humans actually only have 400 olfactory receptor proteins. And what's interesting though is your number of 10,000 is actually partially correct because we're able to pick up about 10,000 different types of scents that our brain can recognize. However, we only have 400 receptor proteins and how that works is they work in combination and essentially make a code of all of the scents that we know and our brain detangles all of that. However, let's look at some other species and see how many receptors they have. So dogs, as many of you I think would guess, have a much better sense of smell than us. So dogs have about 1000 olfactory receptor proteins. Mice have a slightly higher amount. They have about 1200 olfactory receptor proteins. And my favorite example is African elephants, which have the highest amount of olfactory receptor proteins that we know about. So African elephants have 2000 different olfactory receptor proteins, which adds up to a huge amount of different scents that they can pick up. Does anyone have any questions up until now? You're all right? I have a dumb question about elephants. No. What's um, up? Where does their nasal cavity begin? <laughs> Is like their trunk included in that? You know, in most species, the olfactory epithelium is sort of restricted to a small-ish area for the size of their head. Um, so for example, like mice have it here, we have it sort of right at the top of our nasal cavity. Elephants, I have a hard time imagining that it would be in their trunk because that would be a huge amount of tissue to expand all the way down, but I could be wrong. I actually would need to look into that. But if I had to guess, I would guess it mirrors anatomy of a lot of other animals and maybe it's sort of in the nasal cavity entrance, you know, around here. Cool, thanks. Okay, so now we're gonna get into sort of the crux of what I study and what a lot of other scientists in my lab study themselves. So every olfactory sensory neuron only expresses one type of olfactory receptor protein. So this means that this neuron, for example, needs to express the red receptor protein, but make sure that all of these other receptors do not get expressed in its cell. So it needs to make one protein and prevent expression of about 399 other proteins. But this leaves us with the question of how does that happen? Because every single neuron and every single cell in our body actually has the exact same genetic makeup. 
So every cell in our body has the same chromosomes and the same DNA. So how do these all make a different protein then? And to answer that question, we have to look at gene regulation as an answer. Oops. Yeah, and so I just gave away my big question here, but if every neuron has identical DNA in its nucleus, how do all these olfactory sensory neurons make different olfactory receptor proteins? And to go into that, we need to remember how we actually get a protein from DNA. So this might be a review to some of you, but just bear with me here. So I'm gonna go through the central dogma, which is really the process of how we go from DNA to proteins. So in our nucleus, we have double-stranded DNA, which is really the coding material for everything in our cells. Now, DNA gets transcribed into messenger RNA, which is sort of a more specific recipe for how to make a protein. mRNA can be transported to where it needs to be moved to. And then from there, mRNA gets translated into a polypeptide and a polypeptide folds into a protein. And so our question here now, is if we know that we have one olfactory receptor being made and hundreds of them have to make sure that they are not being made, at what level in the central dogma do you guys think these cells stop olfactory receptors from being made? So if this blue receptor is being made, do you think all of these gray ones are getting transcribed? Do you think they're getting translated? What do you think is going on in the nucleus? Does someone wanna yell out an answer? Do we think it's transcription is stopped? Translation. Mm, the What's that? Maybe translation? I have no idea. So this actually brings up the interesting question here. So Abriana just guessed it's translation, which a lot of people would also guess because we're not making the protein, right? But it actually turns out that olfactory sensory neurons prevent all of these other receptors from being made by preventing them from ever getting transcribed. So if this blue olfactory receptor is being made in a cell, all of these other ones never get transcribed so that they never get turned into RNA and they never get turned into protein. So I think we missed one question in the chat. Um, oh. Yeah, I was sorry. That... Oh yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just, didn't want to interrupt uh, Natalie earlier, but yeah, Kaylin had a question. Does a receptor only allow one specific type of chemical, almost like a lock and key, or is it more induced fit? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So the simplified, and this is always how I feel like us scientists answer questions. There's a simple answer and a complicated one, right? But the simple answer is that every receptor only binds to one type of odorant. But the truth is that people are finding in recent years that an olfactory receptor actually binds to a small group of chemicals that are similar. So this gets a lot into chemistry, but say alcohols, for example, there are different types of alcohols, but they have similar functional groups. And it turns out that a lot of receptors are a little loose and they'll bind to similar molecules, but it is very lock and key in that outside of that group, if an odorant comes up to the receptor, it will not grab onto it. It will keep floating around. Thank you. Yeah, and so as I just said, we find out that as one receptor is getting transcribed and translated, the cell prevents all of these other ones from ever getting transcribed. And it does so through something called heterochromatic gene silencing. So that's a really large, complicated sounding phrase, but we're gonna walk through it. So it turns out that all of these olfactory receptor genes in the nucleus that stay silenced, stay silenced by being compacted in heterochromatin. So what we're looking at here is DNA in gray that's being organized in the nucleus on proteins called histones, shown in blue. And you see in heterochromatin that the DNA is extremely tightly packed together. And it's so tightly packed that proteins, which would help transcribe it, shown here, cannot actually fit in there to interact with it and transcribe it. And so the way I actually like to think about this is imagine if someone wrote a note to you on a piece of paper. And if I asked you to read that note, you would have no problem doing so. But if I crumpled up that note into an ex like tiny ball of paper and I handed it to you, you would have no way of reading it, right? It's too compacted. And so it's similar actually. All of these genes get crumpled together so tightly that they can never get transcribed. However, that one olfactory receptor gene that does get transcribed is euchromatic. And what that means is that active gene lies in DNA that is loosely packed. 
So you see here on the bottom that in this situation, the genes in euchromatin can interact with various proteins and they can get transcribed. So what we've learned from this system is that the hundreds of olfactory receptor genes that are not being made in a cell are silenced through heterochromatin. However, that single olfactory receptor gene that does get transcribed is in a euchromatic area where it can interact with RNA polymerase. And so this is a really cool piece of data that was collected a while back that really showed us how this is occurring. So as I said, these hundreds of genes not getting made are heterochromatic. And what we're looking at here is an extremely highly magnified image of an olfactory sensory neuron. And in particular, we're looking at the nucleus of this cell. So the white border outlines the nucleus of the neuron. And the blue is staining for all of the DNA in the nucleus, every single piece of DNA, it's blue. And we see here that the very bright dark circle here is heterochromatic, right? Because it's very dense. That means there's a lot of densely packed DNA that's in heterochromatin. And we see the euchromatin is sort of surrounding it with this kind of blue area, but it's clearly not as dense. And now when we stain for every olfactory receptor gene in red, we see that they all compact together extremely tightly, as you see here in these arrows. And so this was the really early piece of data that our lab collected where we realized that these genes are being compacted together into heterochromatin, which prevents their transcription. And so now that we know what's happening to the genes that are not getting made, we need to think about what happens to that single active olfactory receptor gene, right? So all of the inactive genes are silent and they're in heterochromatin, shown in red. However, that single active olfactory receptor that gets expressed in the neuron actually escapes this heterochromatin. So think of it being physically pulled out of that tightly compacted DNA. And then once it's in a euchromatic region, it's free to interact with various proteins, various transcription factors, and various DNA elements to help transcribe it and eventually translate it. And so the focus of what I study in my research is to understand what happens to this active olfactory receptor gene when it's out of heterochromatin. So I wanna understand the many proteins that this gene interacts with that help it stay in uh, euchromatic territories and prevent it from being silenced again. And I also wanna understand how they all come together to transcribe that gene. So what I do is I use extremely high resolution microscopes to visualize all of the many combinations that could be occurring here to try and understand how this gene gets transcribed and eventually translated. And so in conclusion, I wanna take a bigger step back and go into why is this important? We really quickly went from talking about the anatomy of a nose to how a gene gets turned on and off. Why does this matter? Well, there's a few reasons. The first is that these concepts apply to many systems, and this is something that you're going to find in many legs of science. We study our system so that we can understand it, but also so that we can apply it to other systems. So for example, this research, we study gene regulation and protein interactions and neurobiology. Now all of these relate to the olfactory system, but they apply to many others that can hopefully be helpful in the future in other cell types. And then secondly, maybe a little more basic is simply that olfaction is one of our major senses and we do not fully understand it yet. So thankfully, we now understand that we have these receptors that help us smell, but we really don't know a lot about how they are made. And we don't know a lot about other things that I haven't talked about, such as how these neurons stay healthy, how they organize and how they wire to the brain. And then finally, I wanna conclude with talking about something that is a little more relevant to what you guys may be hearing about in the news. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard or read about the fact that a lot of people with COVID-19 lose their sense of smell. So the loss of smell is actually called anosmia and hyposmia is a decrease in smell, but not a full loss. And so our lab and other labs are trying to do a lot of research to understand why this happens. Why do patients with COVID-19 almost not almost always, but very frequently lose their sense of smell. And what we've actually learned is that these olfactory receptor proteins that I've been telling you about are not getting made in patients with COVID-19. So they don't have the basic protein that they need to bind to chemical odorants. 
Now, why that is, we really don't know, actually. We're still doing research to figure that out. It could be something in the neuron that is causing them to die. They could never be transcribed. We really don't know that yet. And so we're trying to figure that out um, to better understand why so many COVID patients lose their sense of smell and why some of them don't get it back, actually. I have a quick question. Yeah. So is it is are the, all the olfactory sensory neurons still there and alive? Are they, they just are. missing the receptor? Yeah, so patients with COVID-19 still have olfactory sensory neurons. Um, some of them don't look as healthy, but the problem is it's hard to physically image these because it comes from sick patients, right? Um, but they do have their neurons. And for the most part, they seem to have the necessary you know, machinery that all neurons would. The critical difference is that they don't have olfactory receptors. Thanks. Um, but what would it mean that some patients still retain the ability to smell? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? But um, is there any reason why that some patients still remain the ability to smell? Or no? Yeah, that's a good question, and we don't know yet. So we're trying to figure out what is, oops, what is the upstream reason that is causing these to die, right? Because once we know why olfactory receptors are not being made, maybe we can figure that out. Why some patients have them and some patients do not. It, why, we, why we have this you know, heterogeneous sample that we're looking at. Um, so it's a good question. And I would love to know the answer, but we're, we're still trying to figure that out. And so with that, I'll take more questions. If anyone has any. I have another question. Mm -hmm. So if COVID-19 causes anosmia through just not allowing the receptors to be made. Mm -hmm. What about in cases of other diseases that do show anosmia also like Parkinson's? Do the Parkinson's disease patients also have their neurons but are just missing the receptor or do they do lose their neurons altogether? Yeah, so I don't know as well about that, but I do know there's a few reasons. Um, Parkinson's in particular, I think I remember that they do not have receptors, but I could be wrong. I'd need to look into that. But um, other things like the common cold and other reasons, sometimes it's simply that there's mucus blocking the receptors too thickly, right? Um, the most common reason for losing smell is mucus or some sort of blockage that prevents them from binding to odorants, um, or it's then most likely a receptor is not there. Um, often people do have these neurons. It's just that something goes wrong in the neuron itself because these neurons are present from you know being a baby to an adult. They really don't change throughout life. Um, so physical damage to them is a lot less common for why anosmia happens. But Parkinson's, I can't remember off the top of my head. And some people are actually trying to work on like diagnostics for things like Parkinson's to use smell. And similarly with COVID, um, that I don't know as much about, but there's sort of a lot of people that wanna try and use it as a diagnostic because it's so common. Any more questions? Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. so, sorry, my, my camera somehow. Yeah, Thank you for the time. Really informatic. Because I'm not a science student, so I, I've always been quite interested in science. Mm -hmm. so we're now like, um, I'm actually from the architecture department, and we're actually doing a um, scent and gender research that okay. might be called a project eventually spatially. That's why I asked the question before. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, say, um, if we are, we wanted to tackle people who's like non binary in gender and mm -hmm. to create space for like these non classified people. Mm -hmm. And just wondering, um, say, if people take hormone pills and stuff, will that affect their, like, their, their olfactory receptors and stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. And correct me if I'm wrong. So you're asking if people that are on hormone pills and other supplements, if that can affect their ability to smell. Mm -hmm. um, that I know of, I do not think so. But I also, I'm a little unfamiliar with that field. Um, but you do bring up something that's really interesting. Um, and that's sort of what is happening in the brain. So what I was just talking about was all about the biology that's happening in the nose. But from there, there's a signal that's sent to the brain and the brain somehow decodes what you are smelling from a complex code of signals. And then it somehow associates a memory or it associates an action for you to take. Um, and I think your question about how different genders smell and interpret sense 
um, and not even genders for that matter, but just many different people and demographics, how that plays a role. And that gets into some really complex questions about brain and thought and memories that, that I don't quite know about, but you pose an interesting question. Um, do you think like, say if some like sort of scent is like stronger or um, less intense in like a, a room, it will make difference for people's like brain, like how you receive it? Yes, so definitely. So we have many neurons in our olfactory epithelium, uh, which means that there are many neurons, um, you know, say there's, uh, let's think of it in colors, a red neuron that scent picks up one type of scent. We still have many red neurons scattered across our epithelium. And so when we smell something strong, it actually works in sort of this cumulative function. Many receptors pick up on that odor and our brain gets many more signals and our brain interprets that as a stronger scent versus if something is a very weak scent, not many receptors are activated and our brain takes less signal from the neurons as a weaker scent is what it interprets. Uh, so will that give you like, say like an alert scent in some way, like to create yeah. like a frenzy? Yeah, so think of it like when a neuron binds to an odor, it's gonna fire off a signal, right? And so if there's something weakly floating around a very weak scent, your neurons picking it up a little bit, right? But say, similar to that mouse video that I showed you, if you float a really strong scent into the room, it's going like this and there's many of them. And so your brain is taking those many, many signals and it's saying, okay, I'm getting a lot of input. This means this is a strong signal. I have a question. Um, yeah. So do olfactory neurons repair? And if not, um, the transport proteins, the memory proteins of the olfactory neuron, do they kind of repair themselves or do they degenerate over time or anything? That's a really good question. So I'm going to scroll back to give you guys a bit of a visual. Scroll back very far. So there we go. Okay. Um, so yes, the question is that these neurons, the, if a neuron dies, it itself does not regenerate, but there are layers of stem cells actually shown here that are not in color. And these stem cells differentiate into neurons. So as these neurons die and they sort of get pushed out, these stem cells rise up to the more top layer and they sort of replenish these neurons. So throughout our life, our neurons die and they continually get replenished. I have a, thank you. Okay. Oh, was that? Oh, I, I have a question yeah. building off of that. So um, is it known whether, like at what point in the layers they start expressing their ORs, their olfactory? Ooh, that is a really complicated question. Um, that has actually been years of research in the making. Um, so yes, the short answer is yes. It's these, so the different layers that we have are stem cells at the bottom that have not differentiated into anything. And then we have immature olfactory sensory neurons, but they're still neurons, they've differentiated. And then here is where we have our fully mature neuron. So the fully mature neurons express one OR, they continue to express it until they die. The immature neurons, it actually turns out that they express a few receptors, until they kind of pick that one to steadily express. Um, but the process of actually understanding the immature neurons and why a particular cell chooses one receptor to make, that's something we don't know that we're putting a lot of time into studying. So oh, cool. that, that, it's, it's a tough question. <laughs> Very cool thing. Uh, Jameson wrote a question. So he's asking, what releases the odorant so the neuron can repeat its firing or does the neuron continue to fire when in contact with the odorant and it stops firing when the odorant unbinds from the receptor? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when the olfactory receptor, I guess I should stop scrolling. I'm going to make you guys dizzy. But when the olfactory receptor binds to an odorant, it actually starts a really complicated signaling cascade in the cell. So it binds to this, it undergoes a bit of a structural change it interacts with many molecules and then the uh, neuron starts to fire. So once this signaling cascade goes all the way through, um, then the odorant just unbinds. But there are some odors that have stronger affinities to the receptors, which causes for increased firing from the neuron. So it's kind of a mixed question, but the short answer is that they sort of naturally bind, elicit a signal and then unbind. But if there's a lot of odors, it will bind, it could unbind, bind again, 
and then unbind if it's a strong smell. Any more? These are really good questions, guys. You're answering my PhD, I think, with all of these, so. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, is the use of heterochromatin and urochromatic kind of uh, the switches of DNA for other types of um, DNA expression, or is it only for smells? Yeah, it's really, it's actually a very common way, uh, a common method that cells use to silence genes. Um, they just tightly compact them in heterochromatin that can never interact with protein factors. Um, and if you think about it, as I said, every cell, of course, in our body has the exact same DNA in it. So, you know, there's a lot of DNA in specific cells that you do not want to be expressed, right? For example, um, in my skin cells, I don't want a really strong hormone to be made or, you know, something like that. And so a lot of these genes that are not supposed to be in a cell type get put into heterochromatin and tightly compact. And um, in that photo that I showed you, the real photo of a nucleus, you see that this is the olfactory receptors that we're interested in. But, you know, I'd say about 40 to 50% of this nucleus is tightly compact heterochromatin. So there are many genes in there that are silenced that will probably always stay silenced. So it's a very common method. But the fact of this gene looping out from heterochromatin is a little more complicated and specific to this system. Any more questions, guys? One more relating back to somebody was asking, right? Do do hormones maybe change or affect these sort of uh, affect olfaction? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you hear that when a woman becomes pregnant, her sense of smell becomes very heightened. Mm -hmm. So do we know anything of maybe the biology there, where you know when a woman gets pregnant, she has many hormonal changes. So do we know if those hormonal changes are causing a higher, you know, yeah. sense of smell, let's say, or something like that? That's a good point. And I've actually never thought of it before. Um, so I don't have an answer to that, but I'm going to try and, I guess, guess one as I talk. But um, the only thing I could think of is it's either the two options, right, are the biology is changing, the neurons are somehow expressing different receptors um, or more of a certain type, or the brain biology is changing. So the way that we associate specific signals changes in a woman that's pregnant, for example. Um, and I don't know which one it is, to be frank. Um, it is interesting to think maybe, uh, you know, a pregnant woman, for example, makes more of one type of receptor. So if you have a lot of one receptor, it's going to pick up a little bit more signal just naturally, you know what I mean? Um, so for a weaker scent, if you have many more receptors, it could pick up more easily, but I don't actually know which one it is. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, any more questions, guys? These are really good questions. Yes. Jameson has one more. I was, uh, I just had a, oh, yeah. just had a, a, I'm drinking coffee and I'm really looking forward to breakfast and <laughs> <laughs> I've been up all night working. Um, and I was just thinking, you know, when I have a taste for something, meaning like in my mind, I'm, I'm picturing like whether it's a fish burrito or it's pancakes and syrup or something, is somehow my, my nose involved in that or is that all inside my head? So when you just think of a taste, it's just your brain. Um, but there is a tight relationship, right, between your brain making that association. Um, however, just if, physically being able to taste is highly reliant on your ability to smell. Um, so it's a two part answer, but just thinking of it, that's all in the brain. Yeah. It, the brain really does a remarkable amount of just processing and detangling. And, you know, we could talk about the association of memories to smell and taste for hours, you know? Right, right. So my nose isn't actually firing when my brain starts thinking of maple syrup. It is not, not until you, not until there is a physical Okay. Top of maple syrup there for your nose to pick up a scent. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, on the line of pheromone that was mentioned just now, yeah. I'm wondering because when I was doing my research, there was this thing called pheromonic spray coming out. Those kind of perfume-wise things. Do they actually like affect the way people smell? So just to check I'm understanding, are you asking, do pheromones affect how we smell or am I missing a part of that? Yeah, I think that's a question because yeah. um, 
came across like those spray that that said like mm -hmm. pheromonic perfume that will change your pheromonic yeah. level basically. Yeah, there's actually a region in our olfactory epithelium that is specifically devoted to receptors that pick up pheromones and stuff like that. So it's a little sub-organization. Um, so there are sort of specific receptors and regions for pheromones, definitely. Okay, and they do like, can like send different signals for like emotion and like say sexual attraction and stuff? Exactly, yeah. And so those wire to the brain in a way that it tells your brain, you know, finding a mate or whatever the pheromones um, function is, yeah. And again, the brain somehow detangles that though. It says, oh, this is from this neuron, which is for pheromones, you know, that means this. So the brain does all of the heavy lifting. Would, depending on your ethnicity, would the kind of pheromones that you find perhaps more favorable change then? I'm just going to ask if I heard that all right. So you're saying, do specific pheromones change the receptors that we have? Like if there's more of one in our environment? Uh, no, I meant like just depending on your ethnicity, would that change perhaps the receptors or, or like kind of what pheromones you find more kind of beneficial? Yeah, I think it's pretty innately set because we experience, there's not a huge amount of difference in pheromones that we sense throughout our life. I mean, for example, we don't have the receptors to sense certain pheromones that a rabbit might give off, right? We only have receptors to detect the pheromones sort of relevant to what our body thinks it needs. Um, yeah, but, but within that subgroup of pheromones specific to humans that are necessary to smell, we pretty much have that set code of receptors for that. But it is an interesting point that there are probably a lot of scents that we will never pick up on because we simply don't have the receptor for that. So a pheromone, for example, from another species or just, you know, we have 400 receptors. Elephants have 1,600 more receptors than us. We physically will never pick up those scents from our environment. Any more questions? So does that mean the elephant like can smell two different species of grass, for instance. I mean, what what is, what is it gain? What from? are those? Yeah, I'd have to look. What are the what are the extra dimensions that the elephant is experiencing? Yeah, I you know I would have to look into that. It's interesting to think like, is it more types of grass? I don't know something like that that they eat that is helpful for them to know. So for us, maybe it's not useful to be able to smell the difference between three trees. But right. if one of those trees is poisonous to an elephant, maybe it's really important to be able to smell them apart. Um, yeah. So that's what I would imagine is that huge amount of difference. And it could explain why animals in general have a lot, or not animals in general, but why a lot of these sort of animals that hunt in the wild have a lot more um, smells. They need to be able to discern different things that to us are just grass or just trees or you know something like that. Right. Or maybe it's like 10 types of bananas, who knows? I would have to look right. into it. It has to be something with food or danger, food or I play. would assume because that's the only thing that we've evolved. To that's gonna be the evolution, right? Sure. Exactly, so I'd imagine it has to do with something that they need to survive in their environment. Um, yeah. And or mating. Would you mind re-explaining yeah. the diagram on the right or your console? On this slide right here? Yes, please. <laughs> So um, yeah, I, brew, I brushed over this a little bit, but um, so what I was, I've been talking a lot, right, about how heterochromatin silences hundreds of olfactory receptor genes in a neuron, because that neuron only wants to express one single receptor. Um, however, we have to acknowledge, though, what is happening to that single receptor? How is it getting expressed if all of its other similar OR genes are getting silenced? And so it turns out that the OR that gets expressed, the olfactory receptor, um, it actually is in heterochromatin for a part of the cell's life. And then it escapes the heterochromatin. So proteins help to physically pull it out of that densely packed DNA. And once it's pulled out of that densely packed DNA, it's exposed to the nucleus and to the factors that can transcribe it. So what we're looking at is this gene of interest physically looping out with DNA around it. Um, 
And there are many protein interactions and many DNA interactions. As you see, there's a lot of red DNA looping together here um, that are critical for this. And that's really what I'm trying to study here is what does this look like in the cell and how does that form? And how does it not go back into the heterochromatin, right? You would think that it would then just snap back, but somehow it has to be maintained and transcribed throughout the life of the olfactory sensory neuron. Does that clarify a bit? Yes, thank you. That's so cool. It makes me wonder for something like COVID-19, whether it's disrupting this little balance, like this perfect balance of proteins, uh, like sort of freeing the OR mm -hmm. because they've been sequestered somewhere else to help make the virus, you know? Yeah, so there are people in our lab, actually there's someone who's logged on to this from my lab who studies this a lot, um, of trying to see how this little interaction hub changes in people with COVID-19 and trying to use very complicated techniques to visualize how that changes. Uh, but the problem is a lot of the COVID-19 research, it poses a difficult question of, you know, these are not just cells that you're growing in a Petri dish, right? These have to be samples from patients and it's that's something that's difficult to study in a lab. So there's a lot of technical challenges with the COVID-19 research. So Tafia has a good question. She's uh, mm -hmm. uh, asked, does the number of receptors determine or affect the smelling radius? Like some animals can smell scent from very far away, for example. Yeah. Yeah, so for us, I'm not sure if it's as important, but actually something that I had a slide on that I ended up taking out was moles as I, I'm smiling as I'm talking about moles that cannot um, see or hear anything. They're walking around the world blind and they actually have you know two, what we would think of as nostrils and based off of where they smell a scent, so right or left, they adjust where to walk. So they actually use sort of the directionality of where the scents come from in their nose. Um, so just what you asked. So that is found in several animals. Wow, it's amazing that they can get stereo perception from such a Yeah, I think that was a recent finding, actually. I was just reading about that last night. It's really interesting. There's some experiments where they'll put a mole in a, you know, a right. experiment and they'll have a 360 degree radius around it, put a piece of food there and you'll see the nose kind of twitch and then they'll do an immediate turn to the right location. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Any more questions, guys? I mean, seriously, you're, I think, asking all the questions. I got one, but it evaporated. <laughs> it evaporated, all right. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you, what was your imaging technique? What are you going to actually do? So for studying these interactions? Yeah, so there's a few of them. Um, our lab does a lot of very high resolution imaging. So we fluorescently label DNA and the proteins, and we look at a very high magnification. Um, I'm also trying to do structural biology, which is essentially a way to use extremely powerful um, microscopes to image what proteins look like. And so I'm trying to actually image what, um, what these complexes look like together at high resolution. But we use a range in the field. It's mostly high resolution microscopy because that's sort of the resolution that we require. So it, is, it, is it optical? Is it near field optical? Is it um, like atomic force microscopy? You know, you... Um... So it's a mixture. So I'm using a lot of like atomic microscopy, um, okay. but some people just use near field for the less resolution. So it really depends. Yeah. Okay. But, but it, it is, it is uh, atom and molecule size type. Yeah. It's so not, that's what I am normal, doing. It's not yeah. neural microscopy and it's not electron microscopy. No. So there's some of that. And then, yeah, there's a, a range, but yeah, it's a range between atomic resolution and then also just your basic bright field microscope. Okay. I'm a physicist, so that's what I'm bringing to this. Ah. So I find, you know, you know, yes, the gotcha. The yeah. leading edge of using, you know, a molecule as a detector is just fascinating. It's crazy, yeah. It's that's. I mean, it's these are really, really small structures, and everyone in our lab is trying to study from the very magnified level of what do these proteins look like, all the way to where is this neuron wiring. So we're really trying to hit every level of resolution to understand. Right, this. right. That's great. That you can get, you know, different. Use different techniques to get the different decades of yeah, and as they get combined, information. Exactly, that's how we can really understand this. Yeah, that's cool. I love it. <laughs> Great guys, any more questions? I'm really impressed. You guys are cracking my thesis and many other <laughs> theses in our lab. <laughs> 
Great. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you.